Hello, welcome to Coal in the Community. My name is Courtney Hesch and I'm a speech language pathologist and a director of rehabilitation for Coal Health. Today I'm going to take some time to go through the hearing screening process with you. And what better month to do this in but May, because it is better hearing in speech month and it's a fantastic way to bring some attention to an aspect of our field of speech language pathology, uh, which is hearing. And most people don't really realize that we deal so much with hearing, but we do. Our training objectives for today is I'm going to take you, the public, through the importance of adequate hearing skills and how hearing impacts the development of speech and language skills. I'm also going to give you a quick introduction to the hearing mechanism, a little bit of anatomy, nothing too in-depth, but just to give you an idea of what that structure is like and uh, what all goes into hearing. I'm also going to provide information about how we identify hearing disorders. And then I'm going to explain how Cole Health is helping to identify hearing disorders with our potential patients. So I thought maybe the best way to target this would to go through would be to go through some um, quick Q and A's uh, of most frequent questions that I get when parents are calling and having uh, questions about the referral process and what documents are needed and then hearing screenings and giving them more information about that. So these are just some of the most common questions that I get. What's the relationship between hearing and speech and language? Why am I being asked to get my child's hearing screened? Well, the reason why therapy companies request or require hearing screenings is because if a child is having difficulty hearing, it has a direct impact on his or her ability to develop speech and language skills. Essentially, if you can't hear it, then you can't expect to develop speech because you don't hear it well. And if you're not able to speak, then you can't build language to communicate with others. So hearing is really vital. Are hearing issues really that common? Hearing disorder is actually a convoluted term. There are various causes and degrees of hearing loss. And just according to the CDC in 2017, 1.7 out of every thousand babies screened exhibited some degree of hearing loss. But what this really doesn't account for is temporary and treatable hearing disorders that are far more commonly occurring. By far the most common cause of hearing loss in children is middle ear infections or what we call otitis media. And this calls for some training and this is where the anatomy comes in that's going to be helpful for us. So this is your ear. Yes, your ear is not just that outer part that you see and that you hang jewelry off of. No, it's actually this whole structure. So all of this is going on inside your skull. And it's actually a pretty compact area, but it does so much for us. So this outer part is called the pinna, and that's this cartilage part. And then you have the external auditory canal, and that's what you usually clean with a Q-tip. And you can kind of stick your finger about to, I don't know, about into here. So it's a pretty narrow passageway. You can't get much in there bigger than a Q-tip and really shouldn't be putting Q-tips in there and compacting that wax anyway. Then you have this tympanic membrane or your eardrum is most commonly called. And then you actually have the three smallest bones in the human body are in the middle ear, your incus, malus, and stapes. And that helps translate sound that hits that tympanic membrane into your inner ear. So this structure that kind of looks like a squid seashell looking thing is um, all in your inner ear. So you have three sections of your ear, external auditory canal, your middle ear, and your inner ear. So the part that we kind of want to um, focus in on right now is this middle ear. So what you can't really tell here is that this middle ear is supposed to remain air filled. And this is a critical part for our babies and a lot of times why babies are referred to us is because this passage that's supposed to stay air filled gets filled with fluid. And you're probably thinking to yourself, well, how does that really happen? Very easy. So when you're a baby or you're a small child, you don't, babies don't really have much of a neck. It's all like their head and neck is so in such a compact area. And so this eustachian tube is used to ventilate this middle ear. So it's used to uh, keeping that port open so that that middle ear can stay air filled and ventilate. So anytime you have a body cavity that's not able to ventilate and is supposed to, it will fill up with mucus or make its own fluid. So anytime we have this congestion, and here we live on the Gulf Coast, so 
we have right about now in the spring time, we have lots and lots of pollen outside. It's coating our cars in that hazy kind of green color and everything else outside. So we have all these allergens that come in or just general congestion that will clog up the Sustation tube and the Sustation tube actually runs from your middle ear down to where around the, the side of your adenoids and it will drain off that congestion or the stuff that's in your middle ear. Well, when you're a baby, that eustachian tube is more level and as you grow, it begins to tilt and then you can get all that runoff once it gets, um, you get congested and that port's not able to ventilate, then it, once you're open that port again, then it can flow down more in a downhill um, slant and all of that can run off. Well, when you're a baby, doesn't really have anywhere to go. And so you have those babies that are just more prone to having fluid in their ears and it just kind of stays there. So you definitely want this eustachian tube to stay open and to ventilate that middle ear, otherwise you're just gonna have fluid. Well, you think of it, you see it a lot in babies because they're the ones who get tubes put in their ears or they're on antibiotics off and on. <clears throat> it's not necessarily that they may have a problem with ear, multiple ear infections, but sometimes it's just like one really persistent ear infection that we treat it for 30 days with an antibiotic and then it's just not strong enough and there's still some remaining bacteria that harbors in there and then it just kind of regrows. Sometimes it is multiple ear infections, but sometimes it's just one that just won't go away and it's persistent and it's in such a small area. So, what do we do about it? Most of the time the doctors will see, you see a baby that comes in, they spiked a really high fever really quick. A lot of times you look in those ears and you see that they have an ear infection. Well, do we have fluid off and on? Sure. Even into adulthood, when we have congestion, that port is not able to stay open. The Sustation tube is not able to ventilate and you'll get fluid in your middle ear. But what it's designed to do is to, once that port opens up again and you're no longer congested, that that fluid will reabsorb into the body. But you just don't see it all the time, especially in little ones and babies. So adults will have problems with fluid and may never ever have an ear infection. But our babies, if that, and if that fluid stays in there long enough, it harbors bacteria and it becomes an infection. And then you have this middle or this inner ear part that has these little loops right here. Those are called your semicircular canals. That's your balance. That tells you where you are in space. It's really cool. So you are able to tell whether you're upside down or you're sideways or you're right side up. And then it gives all that information over to the vestibular nerve that takes it and tells your brain where you are in space. But this part that looks like a shell here is where the, the sound that comes in through your auditory canal, it reverberates off of that tympanic membrane. It sends that information to those three bones and then into the cochlea. Inside your cochlea, there's lots of little hair cells that vibrate at certain frequencies. So that will transmit that sound through that cochlea and then up through this right here is called your cochlear nerve that sends that information up to the brain so that the brain can process the sound. And all of this is going on inside your skull in a very compact area. So like we said earlier, little babies that just constantly have fluid in their ears, ear infections, how can we help them? Well, most of the time those babies are referred for what we call PE tubes or pressure equalizing tubes. And what those tubes do is they're inserted into, uh, surgically inserted into the eardrum or the tympanic membrane. And it's a manual way to keep that port open and to drain off that fluid. So when the eustachian tube is not working at its best and it's not able to ventilate and release that fluid, we can put PE tubes into the eardrum and it will manually lose that fluid that's caught in the middle ear because that space again is supposed to remain air filled. So a lot of times after you have a baby who has PE tubes that you'll they'll wake up in the morning and you'll see that kind of green or opaque white discharge all over their pillow or outside of their ear sometimes in their hair and that's actually a good sign that means that it's getting that fluid out of the middle ear. 
So a little bit on the hearing screening process. Your child will have had their hearing screening done twice prior to the age of five years. So your child had their first hearing screening completed via auditory brainstem response, or what we call ABR screening during their time in the hospital after they're born. It's very common for them to fail at one ABR and be rescreened before they even leave, but they will have an ABR before they ever leave the hospital. ABR assessment tells us that the sound has reached the brain. So if we go back to this diagram here, it's actually going to tell us that sound has come in the external auditory canal, that it's reverbed off of that tympanic membrane through those bones of the middle ear and through the cochlea and then onto the cochlear nerve and up to the brain. So it will tell us that that sound is being processed by the brain. The second hearing screening that is performed is uh, completed at your child's four-year well-child check with their doctor. The hearing screening performed at this fourth-year well-child check is usually done via audiometric screening or through an audiometer, and this requires an active response, meaning the child must indicate that the tones presented at specific frequencies and loudness levels are detected in the correct ear. And if they fail any one of those frequencies in any ear, then they fail, the, they fail the hearing screening. Another form of screening sometimes completed is what we call OAE or autoacoustic emission screening, which tests the integrity of the cochlear function. So if you go back up to this diagram, this OAE, what it's going to do is it's going to say that sound came in the external auditory canal, reverbed off of that tympanic membrane through the three bones of the middle ear and on into the cochlea, and that those hair cells that are in the cochlea are filtering that sound, and they're perceiving that sound, and they actually send a sound back down that pathway and out the ear, and that's what registers for the hearing screening and lets us know that the cochlea is processing that sound. So that's all OAE, autoacoustic emission screening. So my child's hearing has been screened twice. So what's the issue? As we learned in the review of the anatomy of the ear and knowing how common it is to have fluid in the middle ear impacting a child's hearing, we see a possibility of acquiring hearing issues as high because they're screened at birth and then not again until they're four. So the critical period for language acquisition where everybody knows this in our field is from birth to age five. Now we can see the impact of hearing on speech and language development, right? Because a child can potentially go four out of the five critical period years of language development without a hearing issue being identified. And as a speech language pathologist, that makes us panic a little bit because we want to get those babies in as soon as possible and get them treated as soon as possible. So going four years, maybe they pass their ADR, but they've had fluid this whole time on and off and now they're four, four and a half, and their speech is not good and they're not developing speech and language and it makes a whole lot of sense, but we wanna get them way earlier than that. So what if my child fails a hearing screening? If your child fails a hearing screening, they may be asked to return for a rescreen after their doctor has had a chance to look in their ear and rule out possible middle ear fluid or infection. If fluid and infection has been treated or ruled out, usually they get a round of antibiotics for 30 days, then they'll be referred for a rescreen. If they fail a rescreening, then they'll need to be referred for a more in-depth hearing evaluation. So what we've talked about up until this point is just hearing screenings. But if you keep failing a hearing screening, then that's just further need for you to go on and have an actual hearing evaluation done that delves a little bit more into that mechanism. If my child has a hearing loss, is speech still appropriate? Absolutely. As we learned earlier, the development of speech and language skills requires adequate hearing skills. So if a child with hearing loss can receive hearing aids or hearing devices or be treated if it's otitis media, then they can be enrolled in speech therapy to help them re remediate any deficits noted in their speech and language development. So absolutely speech is necessary. Do I have to wait until my child's hearing evaluation is completed to start therapy? Not necessarily. Many children are referred for speech therapy and while they're in the referral process, they fail the hearing screening and are referred for follow-up screening or further hearing evaluation. 
depending on the requirements of their insurance, the child may be able to continue in the referral process and start treatment as they are seeking further hearing assessment. So how can Cole Health help me with this process? Well, Cole Health currently provides two types of hearing screening procedures discussed earlier. We do audiometric screening and we also do OAE screening. If a child is referred for therapy and does not have a hearing screening on file, or maybe one was attempted with their doctor at their four-year well child check, but they were not able to complete the, or be conditioned for the screening, then Cole Health can provide either screening procedure to meet the screening requirement for therapy. This is good news. How do we know which screening procedure is right for my child? So the general rule of thumb we use is if your child is four years or older and is able to indicate that they heard sound stimuli in either ear, they'll be referred for audiometric screening. Pure tone audiometric screening requires active participation, remember? So this is a sound stimuli presented at four different frequencies at 25 decibels in each ear, and the child will need to be able to indicate that they perceive the sound by lifting their hand when they hear the frequency or the sound through the earphones. However, we know that this can be hard to determine in advance. Therefore, this can be attempted. And if the child is not able to be conditioned for this type of active screening, they can then be referred for OAE screening at our centralized location offering that type of screening. So this is just an example of what audiometric hearing screening or pure tone hearing screening would look like. You put earphones on the baby's ears and they have, you have the red side goes on the right ear and the blue side goes on the left ear. You administer the frequency and the baby raises their hand to let you know that they heard it in the right ear. If they fail any one of those frequencies in any one ear, then they fail the whole screen. If a child is referred to Cole Health and is under the age of three years, or perhaps they have other complicating factors that would otherwise prohibit them from completing active screening procedures like audiometric screening, then they'll be recommended for OAE screening or autoacoustic emission screening. So OAE screening is what is referred to as passive screening. A small probe, much like, um, like ear pods that fit in just to the entrance of the EAC or external auditory canal, it's the same thing. Uh, a probe is placed right on the inside of the ear and four frequencies are presented at two second intervals per ear. And as long as the child is able to remain relatively still and quiet, they'll be able to complete this type of screening. So this is what OAE screening would look like. It's a little handheld um, device and you can see the probe just fits in just to that outside of the, of the ear canal. So why not refer all patients for OAE? Cole Health has audiometric screening at every one of our current locations. This is an audiometer at every one of our current locations, which is much more accessible to our patients. So OAE is currently limited to our centralized Cole Health location. Therefore, it may not be as convenient of a location or availability time as audiometric screening. And many of our current patients would be able to participate in audiometric screening. So this is more out of convenience for our families. So what does all of this mean for our patients? So Cole Health is very aware of the hardship and confusion that the referral process can cause. Therefore, to ease this process, Cole Health has um, taken on an extra step to be able to provide both screening procedures to our current and potential patients. <clears throat> it's just another way that we seek to bring hope and change lives here in Texas. So if you still have questions and you've gone through this whole process and you're still not really sure what's going on with your baby or if you should be concerned or if you don't know what kind of hearing screening is going to be recommended for your baby, that's okay. You can call any one of our co-locations, the nearest one closest to you, and any of our representatives would be able to walk you through that process. Now, anytime you have a referral that comes in from your doctor, or maybe you've asked your doctor for a referral, once we receive the referral, then a patient care manager is actually gonna call you and walk you through the intake process. So this is probably the most successful way we have of figuring out which screening procedure is most appropriate for your baby. So they're gonna ask lots of questions on medical history and their current functioning and their current skills. And that will help to determine which 
is the most appropriate screening procedure for your babies. But anytime you have any questions, always call your current, your closest call help location and they'll be able to help you further. Thank you so much for joining us today. I hope that this gave you a little bit more insight into um, hearing screenings and the ear and everything that goes on with it and inside of it and how it is so vital for the development of speech and language skills. Thanks for joining us and y'all have a great day. Bye.